is now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. The Liberals can't seem to get anything right when it comes to the energy file. The waste never seems to end. $12 million wasted on consultants and advertisements. $28 million losing a lawsuit for a project that hasn't even been built. And the newest scandal? Mr. Speaker, an $81 million accounting error by the independent electricity system operator, or the IESO. Just like that, the IESO's deficit grew by $81 million. Mr. Speaker, are the Ontario ratepayers on the hook for $81 million liberal accounting error yet again? How does this keep on happening, Mr. Speaker? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, the, uh, the member opposite should know that there are no additional impacts to uh, ratepayers. I believe this is an issue that goes back to 2010, Mr. Speaker. Um, the $70 million in savings from our recent Quebec agreement remains a net savings to Ontario ratepayers. And as I say, the issue that the, uh, um, that the member is uh, referencing is something that goes back to 2010. There are, new there are no additional uh, impacts on, uh, on ratepayers from that uh, issue, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Not quite the answer I got from the Deputy Minister this morning, but so much for being transparent. The Liberals tribes have tried to hide this $81 million mistake. The public accounts say that they have applied to the Ontario Energy Board to raise rates to correct this Liberal accounting error. I hardly think that it's ethical for the Liberals to hide hike hydro bills to make up for their mistakes. Speaker, has the $81 million in hydro rate increase been approved by the OEB? And how much more can a family expect to pay to make up for this liberal accounting error? Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the honourable member for his question. As we said in committee, um, we need to be very clear from the outset that there is no new additional impacts to ratepayers. Um, accounting experts determined over which periods these payments would need to be recovered, and this was done in 2010, Mr. Speaker. And all government agencies and used these standards, Mr. Speaker. They changed from GAAP to PSAB. So last week in the House, Mr. Speaker, we passed legislation to save 5 million Ontarians 8% on their electricity bill. And this week, Mr. Speaker, the opposition is talking about accounting practices for pension payments dating back to 2010 that have previously been disclosed through several years' worth of public accounts. In the speech from the throne, Mr. Speaker, we announced regulations to save up businesses to one-third of their energy costs. This week, the opposition talking about accounting practices and disclosures yes, from years ago, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue to stay focused on the issues, Mr. Speaker, while they just shake their fist at things, Mr. Speaker. In the middle of the hustle and bustle, I also heard some uh, implements going off, and I'm going to remind all members, do not leave your Blackberries or your instruments on the top of your desks. As they go off, they still get picked up by the uh, AV stuff, and, and it also is uh, harmful to those that have got the earphones on that are trying to hear this. So let's please uh, all keep our implements away. Uh, su final supplementary, the member from. This is another $81 million Liberal scandal that this government is trying to sweep under the carpet here this morning. Speaker, back to the Premier. In just the past two weeks, it's been revealed that this government wasted $12 million on consultants and advertisements, Dang. another $28 million in the Windstream lawsuit, and lost another $81 million through an accounting error. I'll trust the Auditor General's accounting before I trust here, this. Here. Liberal government's accounting any day of the week, Mr. Speaker. This means the Liberals wasted, with all of these three scandals over the last week, another $121 million with the stroke of a pen. We know this is a former federal NDP, but congratulations with these scandals. You've now officially become a Liberal cabinet minister yeah. in Ontario. Yeah. So, Mr. Speaker, how much? Will families be expected to pay to make up for this latest $121 million worth of Liberal scandal, waste and mismanagement? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I know the honourable member likes to focus on my past, but this government focuses on Ontarians' futures, Mr. Speaker. You know what? For those of us on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, 
We know that back in 2010, there was accounting practices that have changed in accordance with expert guidelines, Mr. Speaker. All government practices have changed in relation to that. They went from GAP to the PSAB, Mr. Speaker. What we've done on this side of the House is make sure that we continue to focus on a clean, reliable system. When we're talking about the details of this accounting change, Mr. Speaker, the opposition obviously has no plan when it comes to energy. They can't see the forest for the trees, Mr. Speaker. The only thing that they can see are the big coal piles that they would like to bring back into Ontario and start firing up these coal plants, Mr. Speaker. We have now invested in a clean. The member from Prince Edward Hastings will withdraw. Draw. I'm not amused. Wrap up, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just on Friday, we announced an agreement that will uh, take $70 million out of costs out of our system, Mr. Speaker, that we've actually worked with Quebec over three years in establishing, and that will help Answer. all families in this province, Mr. Speaker. And we're very proud of that agreement. Yeah. Thank you. Your question. A member from Dufferin Calvary. The question is for the Premier. You know, repeating a myth doesn't make it accurate. The first coal fire plant that was closed in Ontario was closed by an Ontario PC party. Businesses across Dufferin Caledon are sharing the effects of skyrocketing hydro bills and what it's doing to their businesses. One business owner Chief told Governor me Webb. if the government hopes to retain what little manufacturing remains in Ontario, they should be very concerned with this issue. Soaring hydro rates have an impact on our ability to spend on capital expenditures and increase wages. I agree. This government has destroyed our province's once proud manufacturing sector because of skyrocketing energy rates, and it is deterring new businesses from creating jobs in Ontario. Will the Premier finally come with a real plan to make energy affordable Question. for Ontario businesses? Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased to rise and answer the question, especially when it comes to the success stories that we have on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, that the government has invested in and in helping small businesses right across the province, Mr. Speaker. The ICI program is something we should all be proud of, Mr. Speaker. Over 300 businesses currently participate in that, 800 megawatts in savings that save all businesses and all families money, Mr. Speaker. I talked about a few examples last week, but let me bring up another one, Mr. Speaker. The Chesswood Arena in North York received about $56,000 in incentives from the Save on Energy program to upgrade their ice rink control system and lighting. The retrofit, Mr. Speaker, not only delivered annual savings of $70,000, but it also improved ice and skating conditions at the rink, Mr. Speaker. I know these programs help conserve energy while saving businesses money, but we also have many more examples. Six auto part manufacturers in Guelph two food processing plants in Brampton, Answer. ten assorted uh, manufacturing plants in the York region, a textile plant in Woodstock. All of these places are benefiting from the programs that we have in Thank place you. to help small businesses, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary, the member from Simcoe Brampton. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, a supplementary is for the Premier. Not long ago, uh, I received a letter from Mr. Brian Torrey of Stainer, who wrote to me to say Ontario's electricity rates are scandalous. Mr. Torrey is a senior on a fixed income and says his hydro bill has increased by 35 per cent in the last two years. Like thousands of others, Mr. Tory finds Ontario's skyrocketing electricity rates completely unacceptable. Mr. Tory wrote that he would like the Premier to visit him and explain why her government has created such a mess with Ontario's electricity system. So, Mr. Speaker, will the Premier agree to visit Mr. Tory and offer him an explanation? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I thank the honourable member for his question. The important thing for, for this government to do is continue to move forward with our programs and our plan on energy, Mr. Speaker, and how we can save families and save seniors uh, some money on their electricity bill. We've done that, Mr. Speaker, just last week. We passed uh, you know, our, the bill that relates to uh, the 8 percent reduction on, uh, on helping families and helping individuals and seniors uh, like Mr. Tory. I think it's important that the, the opposition let him know that this is going to happen on January. January 1st of uh, 2017. It is good news. We also have the OESP program, Mr. Speaker, and I'm not sure of all the details that relate to Mr. Tory's case, but if he does heat his home, 
<coughs> with electricity, Mr. Speaker, then he can qualify uh, uh, with the OESP program, Mr. Speaker, of up to $75 a month, Mr. Speaker. So I'm more than happy to ensure that uh, you know, Mr. Tory and all seniors and all families right across this province are aware of the great programs that we have in place to help families and to Thank help you. seniors. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary, the member from Leeds Grenville. Uh, thanks, Speaker. My question is also to the Premier. Speaker, in addition to soaring costs and unreliable power, the government's energy system has a new way to make it harder for businesses. Louise Severson of Severson Cleaners in Brockville is one of many business owners contacting me about Hydro One's deposit charges. After decades of being an outstanding customer, Louise had a slightly late payment. She was immediately hit with a $1,300 deposit charge. I think that's outrageous, but it gets worse, Speaker. A letter and a personal call from her bank couldn't void the charge. She had to spend $100 on a credit check. Speaker, the Premier can claim this isn't her fault, but the buck stops with her. She's in charge. Does she agree, Speaker, that this is wrong, and will she join me in demanding Hydro One stop Question. gouging businesses with these charges? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I do want to thank the member for bringing forward that question and talking about, um, you know, businesses uh, within his riding. Because we do uh, have programs to support businesses right across the province, from southern Ontario to northern Ontario to eastern Ontario to central Ontario, Mr. Speaker. We have great programs in place that help businesses uh, with their electricity costs if they're having a difficult time, Mr. Speaker. So you know what? When you look at many of the programs that we offer, Mr. Speaker, to help um, small businesses, I hope that the member is talking to this. This individual about the Save on Energy program, that Hydro One would be able to offer this uh, this business because they are offering these businesses right across the these programs to businesses right across the province, Mr. Speaker. You know what? I can talk about many programs. One in Thunder Bay, Mr. Speaker, the uh, Canada Malting Company. They invested in the Save on Energy program, got about two million dollars back and a seven million dollar cost, and they're saving a million dollars a year, Mr. Speaker, on their energy costs, creating more jobs in the. Thank you. New question. The member from Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question for the Premier. When the Liberal government cancelled gas plant contracts for purely political reasons, it cost taxpayers over a billion dollars. Does the Premier know how much it will cost the people of Ontario to cancel the $5.5 billion signed contract? With Windstream. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When it relates to Windstream, Mr. Speaker, we are well aware that the tribunal has uh, uh, provided us with 20 days to work with our federal counterpart, uh, the federal government, to do our due diligence and make take uh, all uh, a look at all aspects of this, uh, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that you know we get this right. But when it comes to uh, you know uh, our investments in this province and our investments in the electricity system, Mr. Speaker, we've actually uh, brought forward 18,000 megawatts of renewable energy, Mr. Speaker, and that's something we should all be proud of. When you look at coal, the next best thing in reducing our GHGs, Mr. Speaker, is the 18,000 megawatts that we've brought online of our renewable energy. And when it comes to uh, natural gas firing, Mr. Speaker, I think that's important for us to talk about the Quebec deal. That's something we should all be very proud of, because the two terawatts of power that we are bringing in from Quebec, Mr. Speaker, will be directly targeted towards the uh, natural gas uh, peaking plants, Mr. Speaker, which will reduce Thank our you. GHGs even further. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, it's clear they don't like this question. Signing the Windstream contract has already cost taxpayers $25 million plus $3 million in legal fees because an AFTA tribunal says the contract is still in force and the province has put it on hold. If the government was committed to producing public power instead of signing lucrative contracts with private energy companies, Ontario's energy system would be free to serve the public interest instead of being tied up in courtrooms and NAFTA tribunals. When Liberals and Conservatives sign private energy contracts, it means putting the interests of big corporations ahead of the needs of the people of Ontario. How much more are Ontarians going to have to pay because the Liberals signed a $5.5 billion contract with Windstream? How much more? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And of course, I'm happy once again to answer this question. Um, Mr. Speaker, as I've said before, 
Um, we have 20 days, Mr. Speaker, to review this case. The question that the, uh, the uh, member brought forward is purely speculative, Mr. Speaker, and there's full of speculation. But what I can talk about, Mr. Speaker, are facts. Facts that we've invested in renewable energy, Mr. Speaker. Facts that we've invested in, in nuclear energy, Mr. Speaker, creating hundreds of thousands of jobs and providing base load contracts, um, base load power for the province, Mr. Speaker. We're very proud of the system that we have in place. It's clean, it's green. It's reliable, Mr. Speaker. On this side of the House, we don't know where they're coming from. They're not in favour of renewable. They're not in favour of nuclear. They're not in favour of so many things, Mr. Speaker. They have no plan. Both opposition parties, Mr. Speaker, have no plan when it comes to energy. On this side of the House, we have a plan and we're acting on it. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, if this is your plan, it's a very scary thought. When our government invests in the energy sector, it should be for the benefit of everyone in Ontario. Signing contracts with for-profit private energy companies leaves Ontarians on the hook for billions of dollars if those contracts are cancelled. We saw it with the gas plants. We're seeing it with a sell-off of Hydro One, which will benefit shareholders over regular Ontarians too. My question to the Premier is this. What will it cost this time to get out of a contract that the government is cancelling to serve its own political interests? just before an election. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We're very, very proud of the, uh, the electricity system that we have in the province, Mr. Speaker. We have an adequate supply of power. The uh, ISO have told us that very clearly, Mr. Speaker. And so when looking at the power that we have in our province, Mr. Speaker, there was no need for us to continue to move forward with the LRP2 decision, Mr. Speaker. So we were able to suspend that and actually save $3.8 billion to the ratepayers, Mr. Speaker, because we know that's important. We understand that some families are having difficulty when it comes to their hydro bills. So Finding ways to help them, Mr. Speaker, is important for this government. When we've done just that, we made sure that we brought forward our, our bill, Mr. Speaker, that's reducing and permanently reducing um, bills by 8 per cent come January 1st. 330,000 families that live in rural, remote, or some northern parts of the province, Mr. Speaker, will see that reduction go up to 20 per cent. The ICI program, as I talked about earlier, Mr. Speaker, is helping businesses right across the province, Thank you. and we're looking forward to helping them all, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Your question, the member from Kitchener Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, you know, this past weekend I was in my riding, and there was lots of questions Who? about e-health. Who, please? The, uh, this is to the Premier. Uh, the, op the modernization of e-health, the uh, optimization, the leveraging of e-health. This Premier and her Liberal government seem obsessed with privatization. Private energy contracts that build in profit margins for companies, selling off Hydro One to the private sector, and now asking their privatization expert, Ed Clark, to figure out the sale price of e-health asset. If she is not planning to sell a part or all of e-health, why did the Premier and her, the Minister of Health in his letter ask Mr. Clark to figure out how much money the province can get for it? It's a, it's a good question. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, you know, Mr. Speaker, I have to repeat, one, I'll repeat it as many times as I need to, that e-health is not for sale, nor are any of its components, the records that are held within. Uh, in fact, Canada Health Infoway, to a large degree, inspired uh, us to uh, approach Ed Clark because uh, Canada Health Infoway has valued uh, electronic medical records and the e-health system uh, in Ontario as providing substantial benefits to the province, and it's actually attached a dollar value to that. And I think it's important as we look forward to. Uh, taking advantages of opportunities, new technologies, uh, the strength that we have already seen in the building of e-health in this province, that we look at the assets that we have. We do an inventory to see uh, what assets we have, and we use that to build a stronger e-health program. We identify if there are gaps. Answer. We, we fill those gaps. If we, uh, we, it allows us to invest more in consumer, public-facing e-health uh, aspects as well. This is the Thank kind you. of work that Ed Clark is helping us with. Supplementary. Thank you very much. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Clark spent $6.8 million on consultants to come to the conclusion that the province should sell off Hydro One. Now the Premier and and her Minister of Health have asked him to put a value on e-health. Surely Mr. Clark won't be doing this alone for free. Uh, how much will the people of Ontario be paying the high-priced consultant so that Mr. Clark can make the case to privatize our e-health assets? Thank you, Minister. Well, again, Mr. Speaker, we're not selling e-health. We have no plans to. We won't be selling it. 
Uh, but I want to talk. It gives me the opportunity to, to talk about those assets that we're asking Ed to uh, Ed Clark to value. Where in 2000, about a decade ago, less than a million Ontarians actually were benefiting from electronic medical records, and today more than 10 million Ontarians have an electronic med medical record, and there are 12,000 providers that are providing that service to them, right down to the family doctor or nurse practitioner, where we know that more than 80 percent of, uh, of primary care providers are using electronic medical records in their practice. We have uh, medication history is accessible for all our seniors. That's accessible in all our hospital and emergency rooms. Imagine that. Before, when I was practicing as a doctor in a hospital, I would have to go into the back room Answer. and pull the files for seniors, which would yeah. often be very big. Now we have access, immediately access, to their medication list for seniors in hospitals. Ms. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you very much. Well, you know, modernization, optimization, leveraging e-health, we need a privatization thesaurus on this side of the house to, to, mo to keep track of what's happening with this government. The Hydro One sell-off has been disastrous for the people of this province. The FAO confirmed we will be in a deficit position after the next election because of revenue loss. We've also seen rates so high that families are forced to choose between uh, saving for their children's future or paying for their bills. This is the reality of the people of this province. Consultants are about the only group who have done well by the Premier's wrong-headed sell-off. The people of this province paid the last consultant bill of $6.8 million. Will the Premier tell us now how much will it cost Ontarians in consultant fees for her to decide to sell off another vital public asset, our e-health asset. You know, the third party can spin this or try to spin this any way they want, but the truth is, Mr. Speaker, we're not selling e-health. We actually want to make it better and stronger, take advantage of the expertise that exists in this province and, indeed, around the world. We're going to be doing it. It's explicit in my letter in concert with the Information and Privacy Commissioner because paramount is the protection of that health data of individual Ontarians. But we have to admit that it, even for laboratory lab test results, we have more than almost three billion lab lab test results for nearly 10 million Ontarians stored digitally, stored electronically. We have more than 700,000 hospital reports that are sent digitally every day to to, uh, to patients' primary care providers so their family doctors can provide better care. This is an amazing system that we've built up over the past decade. We have much more work to do. By having Mr. Clark look at the assets, Answer. he can help us understand how we can make a strong system even stronger. Thank you. New question, member from York Simple. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, today, my question is to the Premier. Don Chapman and Jim Chapman are the owners of Lakeview Vegetables. They are here today in the gallery to join us. Uh, they have made many efforts to reduce and conserve power. The nature of this vegetable processing work is both energy intensive and weather dependent. This year, their bill is set to exceed $1 million, up 67 per cent since 2013. This hydro usage hasn't differed much, but the bill sure has. This year, they hired a paid hydro consultant. The consultant says that the best option for them is to actually use more hydro, yes, more hydro, Question. you heard that correctly. Mm. You see, by using more hydro, they have a chance to apply to a different class of hydro user. Crazy. They Thank expect you. that doing so might save them 100000 a year. Premier, Thank you. my constituents can't wait to see Thank you. I, I stand you, sit, please. Premier. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for bringing forward that question because I think it's very important for us to talk about what we did with the bill that passed last week, Mr. Speaker. We're actually lowering the threshold for many businesses that couldn't qualify for the ICI program. I'm looking. Are you, Jim? Finish, please. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So I'm, I'm very happy to be able to tell them that they actually need to talk, to contact their local utility to see if they do qualify for this because we've lowered it from three megawatts, Mr. Speaker, to one megawatt, Mr. Speaker. That's over a thousand other businesses across this province, Mr. Speaker, that can qualify for the ICI program. And I know many greenhouse growers uh, in the southwest of the province are very excited about this, Mr. Speaker, because they will now be able to qualify for this. And that savings, Mr. Speaker, is significant. Yes, it's up to a third a third of their electricity bill, Mr. Speaker, that they will be able to qualify for by this change that we passed in this House last week, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary, the member from Mahalo and McNuffle. Well, back to the Premier, and we just heard about the pressure on the processing vegetable sector, and as the Ontario Chamber of Commerce reports, a 383 percent increase in hydro bills on this government's watch. Wow. When will the Premier stop signing energy contracts we don't need? The LPR2 has been suspended, but the Minister of Energy has said himself, uh, projects under an earlier program known as LRP1, that includes all the FIT programs, will still go forward. With business and residential paying the bill, when will the Premier stop selling surplus energy at a loss? When will the Premier restore basic economics, matching supply and demand, for example, and restore rational decision-making to Ontario's electricity. Proceed it, please. Proceed it, please. Thank you. Oh, I know you are. Very sorry. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased to rise and, of course, answer this question because on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, we're very proud of the work that the Minister of Agriculture is doing with all of our farmers right across the province, meeting the goal of the Premier to make sure that we have 120,000 more jobs in this sector. And we're doing that, Mr. Speaker, by making sure that we can work with them when it comes to energy, Mr. Speaker, by the ICI program, for example, because we can see, Mr. Speaker, the benefits that many of these businesses can get, especially in the agriculture sector, when they reduce their bills from the ICI program. And many small farms, Mr. Speaker, Speaker will also benefit from the 8% reduction that we're going to see come January 1st. But the one thing, Mr. Speaker, that um, I, you know, I do have to comment about, and when he talked about rational, on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, we're very proud of making sure that we close all coal-fired generation in this province, Mr. Speaker. On that side of the House, Mr. Speaker, the PC party, they are very pro-coal, Mr. Yes, Speaker. Sir. That's the only way that they can talk about getting things back to the way they were, Mr. Speaker. It's unfortunate, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. A member from London Fanshawe. My question is to the Premier. This hour, we have just learned about a horrific multiple murder investigation in Woodstock and London. Police have revealed at least eight elderly residents of long-term care homes were murdered between the years 2007 to 2014. Our hearts go out to the families and loved ones of these victims. But there is a genuine question that people are asking this morning. How do murders go undetected for nearly 10 years inside any long-term care home in Ontario? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, so I want to join the member opposite in recognizing that this is an extremely distressing and tragic, tragic thing for uh, all of the families involved, Mr. Speaker. I don't think there's anyone in this legislature who would not agree that this is a tragic, tragic circumstance. I know that uh, the member opposite knows that it would be inappropriate for me to comment on an ongoing police investigation. Um, the police have made it clear that there is no threat to, uh, to safety, and we now need to let the police do their job, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, of course the investigation is ongoing and the matter is before the courts, but, there, but these horrific multiple murders raise serious questions of oversight by the Ministry of Health and long-term care, and they need to be asked, Speaker. And again, my question is straightforward. How do eight murders happen in long-term care homes without the ministry noticing? Attorney General. 
Officer of Health Long Term Care. All right, Attorney General. Attorney General. Attorney General. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. And I do want to echo. Uh, the, the sentiments that were expressed by the Premier and the member opposite about how extremely distressing uh, time this must be for the families who are involved um, in these uh, cases. It's been stated appropriately, uh, Speaker, that it would be highly inappropriate uh, for any one of us to comment extensively on the ongoing police investigation. Police has made it clear that there is no threat uh, to safety. And we do, Speaker, now have to let the police do their investigative work um, in this matter. Speaker, I also want to inform the House that the uh, Woodstock Police Service has set up a phone number uh, for people to share any investigation, uh, any information as it relates to the investigation. And that phone number is 519-537-2323. Answer. You. Thank you. New question. The member from Kingston and the Islands. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Energy. In 2014, Ontario signed a Memorandum of Understanding with Quebec regarding electricity trade. The MOU involved an exchange of electricity capacity. 500 megawatts of wintertime capacity was provided to Quebec from Ontario in exchange for an equivalent amount in return for the summer months. Speaker, this deal was beneficial for both provinces because it helped ensure electricity supply for both provinces when we need it most. In Quebec, they need electricity during the coldest winter days due to their use of electric heat. In Ontario, we need it at the height of summer. This MOU helped to ensure both of our provinces have the supply that we need at these times. Last week, Ontario announced with Quebec a landmark agreement which builds upon this existing electricity trade with a new expanded deal. Speaker, through you to the minister, could the minister please inform Question. this House about the new electricity trade agreement with Quebec? Thank you, Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I also want to thank the member for that question and her, her tireless work for her constituents in Kingston. Um, I was honoured last week to stand with the Premiers and uh, my colleagues and counterparts from Quebec as we announced this landmark seven-year deal that will help make electricity in Ontario more clean, more reliable and more affordable, Mr. Speaker. As the uh, member noted, electricity demand peaks at different times in our provinces, and that means there is an opportunity to coordinate our electricity systems in a way that's beneficial official, Mr. Speaker, for both provinces. Through the expanded electricity trade deal, um, our province is set to import up to two terawatt hours of clean hydropower from Quebec annually, enough power to uh, power the entire city of Kitchener for a year, Mr. Speaker. The deal will reduce our system costs in our province by about $70 million over the course of the deal, Mr. Speaker. Answer. And just as importantly, the imports of cheap hydroelectricity from Quebec will offset reliance on natural gas power plants, Mr. Speaker. I look forward to answering more thank in the you. supplementary. Mr. Speaker, thank you to the minister for that response. One other part of this deal is an agreement around the storage of electricity. Electricity storage is an exciting new field which has many implications for the future management of our system. Mm -hmm. Ontario has taken a prudent approach to exploring the value and potential of electricity storage with many of the technologies still at an early stage. I look forward to future discussions with St. Lawrence College, for example, regarding their energy programs and these new technologies of the future. One long-standing version of electricity storage is the hydroelectric dam. The ability to store, store water in a reservoir to be run through a generator only once it's needed, mm -hmm. similar to the system that's being used at Beck genera Generating Station at Niagara Falls. As part of this deal, Hydro-Quebec will allow Ontario to take advantage of its hydro storage capacity. Question. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, could the Minister of Energy please explain why this type of storage delivers value to Ontario ratepayers? Thank payers? you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for that question and, and highlighting a very important part of this, this, uh, this trade electricity trade deal, Mr. Speaker. As part of our, our electricity trade agreement, Quebec has offered to store up, of, to up to 500 gigawatts of electricity for Ontario at night 
and this power will then be returned to Ontario during the day, Mr. Speaker. And for context, this is a 500 gigawatt hours of power could power about 56,000 homes for an entire year, Mr. Speaker. And the reason this is so beneficial that uh, that electricity is often much cheaper at night, Mr. Speaker. A lower demand for electricity drives down the price, and many generation sources, including nuclear, wind, and hydro, can produce energy at night that could be used at later hours, Mr. Speaker. So Ontario is able to produce the electricity cheaply at night, store it in Quebec, and bring it back to Ontario yes, during sir. the day when it's most needed. Our government, Mr. Speaker, will continue to pursue every opportunity to ensure that we have a clean, reliable, and affordable system for all Ontarians. New question, the member from Oxford. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Premier, the temperature is dropping and winter is approaching. Ontarians are scared of their hydro bills. I heard from a mother whose hydro bill was almost $600 a month last month, last winter. Every morning, her family woke up in a freezing house. They were left in the cold until she could get the wood stove going because she couldn't afford the electric heat. She said it was like living in 1900. Even little things like pizza days and art classes had to be cut. What does the Premier have to say to this mother of three who is scared her family will once again live in the cold because of the cost of hydro? Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased to rise and answer the question uh, from the honourable member. Um, Mr. Speaker, you know what? It's very important for uh, for us on this side of the house to understand that some families are having difficulty when it comes to their hydro bills, Mr. Speaker, and that's why uh, we are so pleased that our bill that's actually going to help families reduce their bill by 8 percent, permanently reducing the uh, uh, provincial HST portion on their bills come January 1st, Mr. Speaker. But you know, we we also did many things. Things even before that, Mr. Speaker, um, you know what? We, we ensured that the, D, uh, the debt retirement charge has been eliminated for families, Mr. Speaker. The OESP program, which they, I know, don't like, Mr. Speaker, we on this side of the house absolutely like it, Mr. Speaker. It felt helps families with $45 a month if they heat their home with electricity. And I don't know the details uh, relating to the specifics of yes, uh, that family, but if they do heat their home with electricity, Mr. Speaker, they can get $75 a month on top of the other programs that I talked about, Mr. Speaker. That's a very Thank big you. benefit for this family, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary member from the Ian Carlton. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, my, my question uh, back to the Premier. Uh, Chris Burton is a manager at Century Position in Ottawa. Uh, he reached out to me over the summer. I went to visit him. He told me that Century Pre Precision was considering winding down one of their subsidiaries because their hydro rates are just too high. He said, quote, she couldn't care less about the number of companies that close <laughs> due to the high cost of electricity. Century Precision is one of the many businesses in the and Carleton facing the prospect of shutting down or moving their operations into a more business-friendly jurisdiction. Quote, Premier Wynne's government has made it all but impossible to do business in Ontario and be profitable, he told me. I have not given an increase to my staff in eight years, not even a cost-of-living increase. We are in survival mode. So I asked, how will the Premier address the businesses like Century Question. Precision, who can't even afford to maintain the cost-of-living increases for their employees, and how Thank are you. Ontarians supposed to be able to pay their bills? Thank you. Minister. Growth. Mr. Economic Development Growth. Mr. Speaker, I, I'm absolutely sure that the member opposite explained to that business that we are indeed the most competitive jurisdiction in all of North America when it comes to operating a business. I'm sure, Mr. Speaker, that she explained to that business that they're soon going to get an 8% cut. In their, in their energy rate, which is very significant savings, Mr. Speaker. I'm sure she explained that to them. I'm sure she also explained to them, Mr. Speaker, that we've, we've entirely eliminated the capital tax that that business would have been paying, something her party didn't support, but something we did. And I'm sure, Mr. Speaker, they've also told that business that we now have the lowest effective corporate tax rate in all of North America, 13 percent lower, Mr. Speaker, than, our, than the competition in the United States. I'm sure that member shared all of those facts with the business, Answer. and I'm very confident that business, if they do the math, will want to stay in Ontario and continue to grow like so Thank many you. other businesses are, Mr. Speaker. Good question. The member from Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker, and my question is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Speaker, last week the Minister announced changes to disciplinary segregation in the province's jails and yet another review, but based on data received by the Human Rights Commission, a majority of inmates 
are isolated for reasons other than discipline. 40 per cent were for mental health, and this Liberal Band-Aid does nothing to address that. The data has a name speaker, 23-year-old Adam Capay, locked up in isolation for nearly four years under artificial light, 24 hours a day. I'm sure that I saw Adam when I toured the Thunder Bay Jail, and the minister would have too. How does this government's changes to segregation help Adam Cape today? Thank you, uh, Speaker, and I want to thank the uh, member opposite for uh, asking this question, a very serious question, and uh, one on this side of the House that we are acting on. And that's why last week, uh, Speaker, I announced these changes in relation to segregation. And I have had an opportunity to uh, sit down with Ontario's Human uh, Rights Commissioner, uh, Renu Montaigne. I've also spoken to the Ontario Ombudsman about this. And so, Speaker, we've introduced changes uh, in our correctional facilities where segregation will be used only as a last resort, where there is no other viable option. And we've also reduced it from 30 days to 15 days for disciplinary segregation. We've created a weekly segregation uh, committee review that will review the cases of every individual in segregation. And we've eliminated the loss of all privileges uh, related to segregation. And we are improving improving the data collection, Speaker. There, are, there is important work to do as part of our transformation in our correctional system, and we're doing that work, Speaker. Thank you. Supplement. Thank you, Speaker. Segregation is the last resort. It's hard to make something a last resort when the government has cut all supports and it has become the only option. This government's knee-jerk announcement about segregation came a day after the minister knew his ministry's data was going to be released by the Human Rights Commissioner. This government has spent at least $44 million preparing for a lockout that never came. Surely, mental health supports to tackle the crisis in our jails is one area this money could have gone. Will the government end indefinite segregation, longer than 15 days, for all inmates addressing the crisis in corrections and providing mental health supports for those who need it? Thank you, Speaker. We are working to transform our correctional system, Speaker. We have, in fact, uh, hired about 1,100 uh, staff, uh, correctional officers, since 2013. We've added 36 mental health nurses. We're adding body scanners to help make uh, our correctional institutions safer. Uh, we've recently opened the Regional Intermittent Sen Centre in London to help reduce overcrowding. Speaker, we take these issues very, very seriously. And that's why we've also announced last week an independent review, a third-party independent review of our entire correctional system in Ontario, with one of the keys, uh, Speaker, being the reduction and uh, goal of eliminating the use of segregation in Ontario. But as it stands today, Speaker, we are using segregation as a last resort only when there is no other viable option. And those supports for the individual Answer. that uh, the, uh, the member opposite referred to are in place in all of our institutions. Thank you. New question? The member from, <clears throat> the member from Davenport. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, my question this morning is for the Minister of Children and Youth Services. As the mother of two young boys, Andre and David, who are enrolled with the Toronto Catholic District School Board, I know that our strong education system positions kids to succeed in life no matter the path forward that they choose. They go to school, they work hard, and they take on new challenges. However, it's difficult for children to learn when they're hungry. Research shows that access to nutritious meals help children learn. But not everyone has access to nutritious meals, including some of the children in my riding of Davenport. Speaker, can the minister tell the House what he is doing to help children in my riding and across the province to succeed? Thank you. Minister of Children and Youth Services. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member from Davenport for her question. I know that she's a uh, strong advocate for, uh, uh, for children in her community. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it is so important that young people have healthy diets, and uh, we know that not everyone in this province has the opportunity to provide their child with a healthy, healthy nutritious uh, meal. That's why, Mr. Speaker, we have a nutrition program uh, that's delivered right across the province of Ontario. And, Mr. Speaker, this program uh, delivers snacks, uh, breakfast, and, uh, and uh, meal programs to uh, thousands of young people across the province. This is a program that, um, that we've really built over time. It's an over $32 million uh, investment.
assessment by the province of Ontario. And uh, I want to thank volunteers, parents, uh, uh, teachers, uh, principals, uh, our educational partners for the work Answer. they do to ensure that young people get the nutritional, uh, nutritional, healthy diets in their schools. And uh, I'll uh, finish you. off on the supplemental. Thank you. So thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the minister for his response. Uh, we have communities across the province that benefit greatly from many of these investments, including uh, communities like my riding of Davenport. And local providers and schools work hard to support kids' learning and development by making sure students get the nutrition they need. Collectively, they are making a difference. However, Speaker, we know some of the most remote communities that struggle with access to nutritious foods in Ontario are First Nations communities. Speaker, my question to the minister is, does the student nutrition program reach these communities as well. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, I'd like to thank the member for the uh, question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, over 850,000 young people across our province uh, receive uh, some type of nutritional program uh, in their schools or with uh, community partners. And uh, we know that um, there are First Nation communities here uh, in the province of Ontario that have challenges finding uh, affordable and nutritious food. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, uh, we've expanded our student nutrition program to over 120 educational settings in First Nation communities. Communities uh, that help really support young people as they develop their uh, uh, not only their body but their mind, Mr. Speaker. Uh, First Nations have worked in partnership with our government to develop innovative program models that meet the needs and strengths in their communities. And Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to build on those programs. It's a four million dollars uh, investment this year, and we know that there's a lot more work to do, but we know we're off to a great start, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Question: Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Municipalities are in charge of delivering important services to their residents, and it's up to them to ensure that they're making the most of taxpayers' hard-earned dollars. Under this government, hydro rates have continued to skyrocket, and yet they continue to deny they're the problem. Speaker, in May of this year, the City of Oshawa received a hydro bill for streetlights. The cost of power for lighting the roads was $3,000. Speaker, what was the cost of the global adjustment? Almost $100,000. Oh, boy. $100,000, Speaker, which is outrageous. Can the Premier explain why she's adjusted the city's bill to over $100,000 when they're using just $3,000 worth of power? Thank you. Speaker, uh, thank you very much for the question. And I, I think it is, uh, it's really interesting for us on this side of the House uh, to get a question from the Conservative Party, uh, the official opposition, when it comes to issues related to municipal affordability. Speaker, many of us on this side of the House that are sitting in these chairs used to sit on municipal councils. And the reason that we ran for provincial elections in two I, uh, I'm a little concerned when I ask to keep things quiet on this side. People on this side, while the answer is being put, are provoking as well. It's not helpful. But that being said, keep it down. Finish, please. One of the reasons that many of us on this side of the House ran for election in 2003 is because we sat on municipal councils from 1995 to 2003, yep. when perhaps the biggest tax shift in the history of this province have occurred when the Conservative Party of Ontario at that time downloaded into the municipal rate base billions of dollars of long-term responsibility that theretofore they had never been responsible for. So, so, so to get a question from the Conservatives about municipal affordability, You see it, please? Supplementary. Member from Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Premier. The hydro disaster is acute for hospitals and long term care homes, where electricity bills spiked by as much as 40 per cent last year. Instead of putting money into better food for seniors, personal support workers, or new mattresses to reduce bed sores, Nursing homes are forced to redirect $30 million to cover last year's hydro hikes away from patient wow. care. 
for one nursing home, a recently built and modern one, that's $325 extra every month per bed, and sadly, more than this government spends to both feed and bathe a senior patient. Wow. Yet this Premier calls it fairness and stability in the system. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I ask her, what's so stable? What's so fair about paying more for hydro hikes than feeding and bathing frail senior patients? Should be a shame. Thank you. Be a shame. Minister of Municipal Affairs. The Minister of Energy has requested this question, Speaker. Minister of Energy. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And it's a very important question that the uh, the opposition member brings forward in relation to hospitals and energy bills, Mr. Speaker. And I'm very proud to say that our conservation program actually helps hospitals, it helps municipalities, it helps arenas, Mr. Speaker. It helps everyone. And for example, Mr. Speaker, in my own riding, the Great Riding of Sudbury, the hospital had an event with Greater Sudbury Utilities in which it saved over $300,000 by participating in one of our Save on Energy programs, Mr. Speaker. That $300,000 that they saved. Mr. Speaker, they said that they can now put that back into the system to actually help do exactly what the opposition MPP is talking about, Mr. Speaker. Use the money that it's supposed to be there for in helping, um, helping families in the health care system. Exactly. We have conservation, Mr. Speaker. We have uh, demand response, Mr. Speaker. We have the ICI program, Mr. Speaker. We have so many programs out there that we continue to promote them, Mr. Speaker. Answer. Unfortunately, on the other side of the House, Mr. Speaker, they just shake. The member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound, the member from Prince Edward Hastings, the member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke come to order. No question. The member from Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, last week's failed launch of the Grade 10 literacy test online cost nearly 200,000 students an entire school day and months of hard work and preparation. Well, experts say that an online attack, and this is important, experts say that an online attack came as no surprise. This Liberal government was caught blindsided with their rushed rollout of online testing. Now it's back to the drawing board for a Liberal government that continues to let Ontario Chief students Webb, down. While the loss of confidence in our education system is immeasurable, how much will the latest IT blunder cost Ontario taxpayers? Thank you. Premier. Minister of Education. Education. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the member opposite for the question. Mr. Speaker, of course, we were very disappointed to learn that the students who had prepared for their online literacy test were not able to do so, Mr. Speaker. This was a pilot that was set up by EQAO after many, Sabotage. many, many, many months of testing and building the system, Mr. Speaker. And, you know, only to learn that through a deliberate malicious and sustained attack from entities that were around the world, Mr. Speaker, yeah. on this system Mr. that our, our students here in grade 10 were not able to complete their online literacy test. Mr. Speaker, this is absolutely outrageous, and our um, EQAO officials are looking at what specifically has occurred and doing their um, due diligence on that, Mr. Speaker, and will come forward to make that information available once it is, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Premier. While the Premier speaks of cyber attacks as if they are science fiction, the reality is her government should have foreseen this type of scenario. Instead, they were left scrambling last Thursday as students and education workers stared at blank computer screens for hours. For nearly 16,000 students that work. Stop. While I'm not uh, particularly happy with all of that uh, bluster, the other people on the other side that are looking for me to stop one side or the other, look in the mirror. Finish your question, please. For the nearly 16,000 students that were able to complete the test in places like Sudbury and Lambton Kent, they don't know whether their passing grades will count or if their efforts were wasted. Again, how much will the failed literacy test launch cost Ontario taxpayers? I'm not asking how, how disappointed the Minister of Education is. I want to know how much has it cost Ontario taxpayers? Mr. Speaker, 
You know, Mr. Speaker, I know that uh, the team at EQAO they worked all weekend long to figure out what the, uh, the source of the issue was. It's actually very consistent with uh, issues that occurred last week at Twitter and Netflix, Mr. Absolutely. Speaker. These types of global attacks uh, are very unpredictable. I also know, Mr. Speaker, that um, the EQAO folks are doing their due diligence to make sure they discover the source of the issue right. and to make sure that we're prepared in the spring to uh, to execute both an online as well as a paper-based uh, literacy right. test. Mr. Speaker, we know that our students prepared very, very, very hard for this Good test, students. and and that is why Good I teachers. have expressed my disappointment in the fact that they were not able to complete the test. We will ensure that no student is uh, is is treated um, in any manner that uh, puts them um, at jeopardy in terms Answer. of uh, the, the opportunity to hands. write the test in the future and to get the grades uh, that they've earned, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, member from Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour. Last year, all parties in the Legislature came together to pass Bill 163, supporting Ontario's First Responders Act. This piece of legislation was one of several new initiatives to help prevent or mitigate the risk of post-traumatic stress disorder among first responders. This government has created a radio and digital campaign aimed at increasing awareness of PTSD among first responders, their families and communities, and eliminating the stigma often tied to PTSD. There's also a free online toolkit with resources for employers and grants for research. Uh, there are all important initiatives and resources for our first responders. Mr. Speaker, the minister also announced an annual leadership summit that he will host, and it's taking place Question. today. Could the minister please tell the House about the summit? Thank you, Minister of Labour. Thank you, and thank you to the member for that. Important question, Speaker. Before I arrived in the legislature this morning, over 200 people joined me, and they were first responders, employers, experts, advocates from all over the province of Ontario, joined me at our post traumatic stress disorder summit organized by the Minister of Labour. This summit, Speaker, is a very important part of the PTSD strategy that we announced last year. People who are attending the summit today, as that's taking place as we speak. They're going to share their experiences, the expertise, the best practices, and we're going to mitigate and we're going to prevent PTSD in our first responders. One of the main goals of the summit is to develop prevention plans. We know they're crucial to the success of all programs. Speaker, the keynote speaker was Bob Delaney, former state trooper, NBA referee, who, along with others, will share their struggles and contribute. Not this Bob Delaney speaker, another one. <laughs> speaker, this afternoon I'll be returning to the summit. We're going to hear from more experts and leaders. Answer. I would urge other members of the House to come down and join me at the summit. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you. I want to thank the minister for his answer and for sharing the details of today's summit with this House. Uh, I'm sure that the day will be a success and those attending will feel inspired by their involvement and collaboration. Speaker, in the minister's new mandate letter, the premier asked the ministry to continue improving mental health protections for Ontario workers. The minister has said that it's very important to him, and we see that following his work on Ontario's Select Committee on Mental Health and Addiction. The Canadian Mental Health Commission has reported that in any given year, one in five people in Canada will experience mental health illness. This is clearly an issue that impacts many people who go to work every day in Ontario. Speaker, could the minister please tell us what else this government is doing to protect the mental health Question. of Ontario workers? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Once again, I want to ask the uh, I want to thank the member for that question. In the last few years, Speaker, we've become more and more aware of the issue of psychological health and safety in the workplace. Speaker, up until about 10 years ago, people didn't really talk a lot about this. We didn't know a lot about the issues. Now people are talking about it, Speaker, and they're taking action on it. Our government, the Minister of Labour as well, takes mental health in the workplace very, very seriously. We're taking some very positive steps in this area, as a member mentioned. PTSD Summit I told you about a second ago is a great way to share best practices. We're seeing action now at the federal level, Speaker. They continue to raise the issue at other levels of government. Speaker, preventing injuries and illnesses in the workplace and encouraging workplaces to promote 
psychological health and safety. It's an essential component of the health, the well-being, and, and the economic success of all, uh, all Canadian speaker. It's Mental Health Month, October speaker. It's a time to Thank celebrate you. the advances. New question, the member from Nipissing. Thank you, and good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Robert and his wife, Carol, live in Northern Ontario. As seniors on a fixed income, they are hurting under this Liberal government's failed energy policies. They can no longer afford to stay in their home. Wow. Carol wears winter clothing and a toque to bed because they cannot afford heat. Significant mold has formed in their home because they can no longer afford to run their dehumidifier. The Financial Accountability Officer confirmed that households in Northern Ontario paid 45 per cent more for electricity costs. Instead of meaningful action, Speaker, this government responds with Band-Aid solutions and more talking points. Northern Ontario deserves better. I ask the Premier, will the government end its failed hydro policies and truly Question. address the concerns of Northern Ontario? Here, here. Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the honourable member for the question. Um, it is important for us to recognize that uh, we did act on uh, helping families in rural and northern parts of our province, Mr. Speaker. 330,000 families will benefit from the 20% the, uh, reduction in, in hydro rates, Mr. Speaker, come January 1st. Specifically, seniors, Mr. Speaker, if they heat their homes, like it sounded it does, I don't uh, know all the details, Mr. Speaker, but if they heat their homes with electricity, the OASP program, Mr. Speaker, will help them up to uh, seven $75 a month, Mr. Speaker. On top of that, there's the debt retirement charge that's been eliminated, and they also have the uh, tax credit for Northern Ontario re residents, Mr. Speaker, which is an also significant saving. I know the uh, the uh, honourable member mentioned uh, the FAO. Um, well, let's talk about the FAO, Mr. Speaker. He talked about energy prices uh, are, are increasing in Canada, and energy costs um, in Ontario are, are uh, consistent with the pace of other provinces, Mr. Speaker. We're in the middle of the pack, and you know what, Mr. Speaker, we recognize and, and agree with. The, the FEO report, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Supplementary, the member from Melbourne, Middlesex, London. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Premier, due to your government's failure to manage energy in this province, small businesses in my riding are struggling. A small cafe in my riding, famous for their pies, have done everything they can to conserve energy. However, they've seen their energy rates go from $1,300 a month to $3,000 a month. $2,000 of that bill alone is global adjustment and delivery charges. Speaker, small businesses like the cafe in southwestern Ontario are on the verge of bankruptcy due to this Liberal government's failed energy policies. Will the Premier explain to my constituents and those throughout southwestern Ontario how can small businesses continue to afford these sky high global adjustment rates and delivery charges. Thank you. Minister, Minister of Economic Growth and Development. Minister of Economic Growth and Development. Well, Mr. Speaker, I, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, well, I'm, I'm sure the member, like the previous member that asked the bu uh, business question, would have ensured that, that, that their business was aware if their, if their bill was around 3000 a year. Because of the action that this government is taking, they're going to save in the neighbourhood of about $3,500 to $3,800 a year from the 8 percent off their hydro bill, Mr. Speaker. That's a significant savings for a small business. So I'm very sure that the member opposite would have made sure that they're aware of that. I'm sure as well, Mr. Speaker, that they would have uh, let that business know of all the work that we're doing with small businesses in the food processing area, for instance, uh, where we've got a red tape challenge that's reducing uh, re regulatory burden for small businesses, where we've addressed it in the auto parts sector. I'm sure that that member would have let our small businesses know that as well, Mr. Speaker, and I'm sure as well that they would, he would have let that, that, that business know that we're Answer. a leader in North America when it comes to producing small businesses and will continue to be, Mr. Speaker. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, I believe we have unanimous consent to put forward a motion without notice regarding the appointment of a temporary financial accountability officer. Yes. The government house leader seeking unanimous uh, consent to put forward a motion without notice. Do we agree? Agreed. Agreed. Government house leader. <laughs> Speaker, that an humble address be presented to the uh, Lieutenant Governor and Council as follows. We, Her Majesty's most dutiful and loyal subjects, the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Ontario, now assembled, requests the appointment of the Honourable J. David Wake as Temporary Financial Accountability Officer, as provided in the Financial Accountability Officer Act 2013, 
and Section 77C of the Legislation Act 2006, commencing on October 24, 2016, for a term of six months or to the date when the Financial Accountability Officer resumes his duties, whichever comes first, and that the address be engrossed and presented to the Lieutenant Governor in Council by the Speaker. Mr. Nackvi moves that a humble address be presented to the Dispense. Lieutenant Governor. Dispense. 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 Dispensed. Do we agree? Agreed. Carried. Member from, the member from Chatham Kent Essex on a point of order. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, I'd like to introduce Aaron Bremer from the 16th class of the Advanced Agricultural Leadership Program, along with Eric LeClaire, Adam Rack, and Cass Gilmore from Lead, New York, as well as I would like to introduce another friend, Lynn Perrier. Welcome to Queen's Park. Thank you. Minister, the member from Trinity Spadina, point of order. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, joining us uh, in the public uh, gallery were students of uh, University of Toronto, member of Political Science Students Association. Uh, I just want to welcome them and I hope that they uh, enjoy the question period. Thank you. Oxford. Speaker, I'd like to ask the unanimous consent uh, for the House to uh, uh, have the moments of silence to recognize the families and be with the families of the people who perished in Woodstock. Let, let me make sure I capture that properly. The member from Oxford is seeking unanimous consent after the vote to stand, stand for a moment of silence in memory of the people that have been identified as murdered between Woodstock and London. Do we agree? Agreed. Agreed. The member from here on Bruce. Speaker, I'd also like to welcome to the House today CEO of the Rural Ontario Institute, Rob Black, and program staff for the Advanced Ag Leadership Program, John St Sandra, Larry Van Doek, Terry Demon, Julie Cayley, and from LEAD, we have Phil Giltar and Tanya Stewart. Thank you. Minister, uh, the member from uh, London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I would like to introduce Andy McTaggart from the 16th class of the Advanced Agricultural Leadership Program, as well as Marie Anselm and Chad Hendrickson from LEAD New York. Thank you. Mr. Education. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, I'm very happy to have a school from my riding at Queen's Park today. I wanted to acknowledge the grades five and six students from the Gulf Road Junior Public School and their teacher, Melissa Morton. They will be visiting the legislature and learning about the beautiful history of our legislature. Um, I want to spend a moment to remind all members we do have a process. If you know they're coming in the middle of question period, introduce them during the time for introductions. We're in the middle of a vote, and it's very unusual to do points of order before we vote. That being said, there are circumstances in which we do want to be respectful, especially, especially when guests do arrive, and I know you want to acknowledge them. If you know they're coming, please do it during introductions. Thank you. We have a deferred vote on the motion of second reading of Bill 37, an act to amend the Early Childhood Educators Act 2007 and the Ontario, Colleges of, uh, Ontario College of Teachers Act 1996. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bill.
Old, old age. All the members, please take their seats. All members, please take your seats. Thank you. October, on October the 17th, 2016, Ms. Hunter moved second reading of Bill 37, an act to amend the Early Childhood Educators Act 2007 and the Ontario College of Teachers Act 1996. All those in favour, please rise. One at a time, be recognized by the clerk. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Napoli. Mr. Napoli. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mrs. Dahmerlock. Ms. Dahmerlock. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Jassic. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Ms. Nidu Harris. Ms. Nidu Harris. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Pot. Mr. Pot. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Verniel. Ms. Verniel. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Urich. Mr. Urich. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Ms. DeNovo. Ms. DeNovo. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Armstrong. 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 Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Fife. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Ms. French. Ms. French. Ms. French. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. The ayes are 91, the nays are zero. That's the way it should be all The ayes being 91, the nays being zero, I declare the motion carried. Second reading of the bill, deuxième lecture, projet de loi. Pursuant to the order of the House dated October the 20th, 2016, the bill is ordered referred to the Standing Committee of Finance and Economic Affairs. There are no further deferred votes. However, I would ask that all members please rise, including our guests, to perform a moment of silence in respect of the victims of Oxford and London. Thank you. Therefore, this house stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.